By the way, um, my good friend and uh, brother and fellow preacher in Christ, uh, Mike Wilson, who's been preaching up in uh, uh, Santa Clara for a number of years. As a matter of fact, Liz, he used to preach in, you and Al have known him from years gone by. He was actually in Alabama, in Birmingham for a while. And um, <clears throat> Mike has just written a new book called um, From Inspiration to Ink. And uh, I've got a copy of it that he sent me. And uh, here, and Mike has a very, very impressive collection, personal collection of works of antiquity, old, old Bibles that are centuries old, and some other collections that he's done. Plus, he's done a vast amount of work and research himself historically. And uh, he's going to give uh, this deal out that in buying bulk, it's going to reduce uh, the cost to about $16 a copy. This, it's a nice with color photographs, uh, a lot of great material, and it's free shipping at 16 bucks a pop if we order 10 or more. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to order at least 10. But if anybody is interested and would like to have a copy of that book, then uh, maybe I'll make a sign-up list can do that because it will be good to have in your library, and that's a good investment without that much money. And, um, and besides that, uh, there's two blurbs. He has put two blurbs of mine in the book, so, you know, that's worth the free shipping maybe. I don't know. But uh, Mike has done a really, really good job on that. And so we'll, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to be ordering that like within the next day or two. He just sent me an email today. <clears throat> when we're dealing with the prophets, and uh, I just want to, us to be reminded that as we look at the Old Testament, New Testament, and I'm not speaking to novices by, by any means, you, you all get this, that typically we speak of the prophets from an overall biblical standpoint of being the Old Testament prophets, though there were New Testament prophets, the apostles, served in roles of prophets. Uh, there were other prophets, both men and women, that served in roles of prophets. Uh, but when we talk about uh, the prophets of the Bible, that takes us typically to the Old Testament. And for example, uh, Adam Clark in his commentary, uh, he had listed what he believed to be legitimately in the Old Testament, and he gives a chronological arrangement of what he believed were 49 prophets in the Old Testament. And so there were some that were prophets that never wrote a book, like Isaiah and Jeremiah did, and, and those kinds. And there are some that uh, were prophets that we don't always look at them as being prophets, but they stated things that were prophetic and came to pass because God revealed it through them. And uh, even as Jude would refer to uh, Enoch uh, of the Old Testament, Adam is even referred to as, as a prophet. But when you go from Ad, Old Testament Adam to Zechariah, and uh, we know that Zechariah, Malachi being the last of the Old Testament, but uh, when we look at those prophecies of the Old Testament, they're not all in chronological arrangement. Malachi does belong at the end. But you're aware of, because we quote this passage all of the time, to see the correlation between the Old Testament and New Testament. And when we're talking about the development of the Bible, so many people don't realize that you, you've got to see how the correlation exists between the Old Testament and the New Testament and how it's been fulfilled and how it works together. And that in and of itself, in many respects, gives it legitimacy or authenticity. I think everybody here just about can quote uh, Romans 15.4, that when Paul says that whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. And, and so we know that those Old Testament scriptures were pro prophetically revealed. The Apostle Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, you may want to turn over and look at that in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, and you've all heard this passage over and over and over. But Peter says this. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any what? Private interpretation. Can there be a temptation to look at prophecy and just want to add some kind of private interpretation? Where it seems to say what we want it to say. And Peter says, no, that, that is not to be done. It's not to be a private interpretation. But in verse 21 of 2 Peter, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, now verse 21, 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And of course, that is the contention. And so the conjecture, the guesswork, <clears throat> and linking modern day events to the prophecies of the Holy Spirit are exactly what Peter is, is warning about, condemning when people just involve themselves in guesswork and conjecture. Uh, we need to let the Bible interpret itself and see how, again, there's this coalescing, if you will, this correlation that exists between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You also are very familiar with, if you'll back up a few pages from 2 Peter, go to the first chapter in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, there the author of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, that God, who at sundry times, or various ways, diverse manners, the King James says, spake in times past un unto the fathers. God spoke to those fathers by what? By the prophets. That's how God spoke to them. By the prophets. Now he'll make the point, because this becomes very much the theme of the book of Hebrews, verse 2. But has in these last days spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ that is, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he has made the world. And so the teaching is obvious. God used to speak to mankind through his holy prophets, but now speaks even today through what we would refer to as a gospel dispensation by his son, Jesus Christ, which is through it's the word of Christ. And we, we see the value of the word of Christ over and over and over. Yet many would have you to believe that God speaks to us through no other way than a continuation of prophets uh, today. And the thing is, is that we study, even as we are on Tuesday nights right now, as we're looking at the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, we saw that there was this natural ceasing or cessation of the gifts with the end of the apostolic age. And so at the end of the apostolic age became the end of the prophetic age. I think this group understands that, correct? So there are no living apostles today. There are no living prophets today. So while we don't believe that there are living prophets today, we do believe in the prophets from the standpoint that these Old Testament prophets, all of the prophets and the Old and New, are critically and important for us to understand, uh, again, how God has fulfilled his will that has been revealed in Scripture. These men spoke. These men spoke a vast variety of types of given information. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, we had our singing last week, that prophets sometimes spoke of the past, sometimes they spoke of the future, they often spoke of the present, but they were mouthpieces for God. And, and so um, it becomes a very, very important study to look at the prophecies. Again, Prophecies are not just something of, that is guesswork or humanistic type of predictions. Uh, we referred a couple weeks ago to Deuteronomy 18. And the simple test is this. That if someone gives forth a prophecy, especially a predictive type of prophecy, and it comes to pass, then obviously you would look at it and say that's credible to believe him. But Moses made it very clear in Deuteronomy 18. If someone speaks a prophecy that does come to pass then he is not to be believed. He is not to be followed. And, and it's not a matter of somebody being right occasionally. The prophets of God, if they were true prophets of God, how accurate were they if they're true prophets of God? Every time, 100%. And so uh, this is never a matter of looking and saying, well, you know, this guy was right half of the time. Uh, there's just, you're not going to find that anyway. About half the time and the other half he was correct somehow. You're just not going to find that. But the moment and that you find somebody uttering a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass. And even in our own more modern history, particularly in the last 200 years. And I'm going to give a comparison because what we're talking about is the legitimacy, the development of the legitimacy of Scripture. Are there those that have tried to some sh somehow show that the prophets of the Old Testament... Be it Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all of the prophets. Are there those that are trying to show that they were not legitimate and that they were not moved by the Holy Spirit? We have a lot of people that are trying to prove that. They've not been able to prove that. Not, not going to be able to prove that. 
And what that does is that gives to us what we would refer to as, again, as credence, as validity to the scripture. But now I want to contrast that with something. How many of you are familiar with the name of the 19th century by the name of Joseph Smith? Now, Joseph Smith started and began what organization? Yeah, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, what became known as the Mormons. They do not like to use the name Mormon today, by the way. They're rapidly trying to drop that. How many of you are familiar with the name Ellen G. White? And Ellen G. White started what religious organization? No? The Seventh-day Adventist. How many of you heard of the name William Miller? Now, William Miller is the one that actually taught Ellen G. White, who started the Adventist movement, and he had prophesied in 1844 that at a particular time that Jesus was going to return, and he convinced many of the disciples of his to sell their possessions, to dress in white robes, to meet in this mountain spot, and because the Lord was coming. And, and of course, that time came, and the Lord didn't. He said that he had made an error in his calculations and said it's, it's going to be in 1845. They did the same thing. But 1845 came, Jesus didn't. Finally, in 1846, when the third time it fell, he faded into obscurity. But what should that tell us about the prophecies of William Miller? Well, don't listen to it. But Ellen G. White and her husband were disciples of his, and she became very vocal in this. But then she claimed to have a vision of which she took a trip up into heaven. And when she went into heaven, there she beheld what she referred to as the Decalogue, which would be what? The Ten Commandments. And she said that she saw that there was a halo around the Fourth Commandment. What do you suppose the Fourth Commandment is of the Ten Commandments? To do what? Yeah, to keep the Sabbath day holy. And then declare that we should continue to keep the Sabbath. And that was the Catholic Church that brought in Sunday worship. And she claimed that was the Pope because there was a Pope that did make an edict of such. But do we go to a Pope to prove first day of the week? No, we go to the Scripture. But she had various writings too. Not only William Miller had many writings, but Ellen G. White had writings after writings. How many of you heard of the name Charles Taze Russell? Charles Russell. Now, Charles Russell started what group? Jehovah's Witnesses there in that. Now, actually, they never referred to themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses after the death of Charles Russell when the one that, that, that succeeded him was a fellow by the name of Judge Rutherford. And it was in the late 1920s that going to a passage in Isaiah that these shall be my witnesses before they were known, by the way, as Russellites. It was a Russellism movement in the late 1800s. And then Judge Rutherford, who wrote many books himself, Russell wrote, he prophesied that he was going, the study of the scriptures it was called, and he said there were going to be six volumes, and that these were going to be Holy Spirit guided, although they don't really embrace the Holy Spirit, they were going to be Jehovah guided writings, but he wrote five of those, and then died before the sixth one was written, which I'll tell you right there, he prophesied there were going to be six, and died when there were five. Is that a problem? Then Judge Rutherford, then these were completed, and then he wrote a book that was called Millions Now Living Will Never Die. And predicted in the early 1900s that by, by 19, I think it was 18, it was the late teens in the 1900s, that by that period of time that there would be no more wars, no more banks, no more houses of ill repute, no more bars, and all of those kinds of things that they would come to an end, and that in 1914 that the Lord was going to return and set up his kingdom on the earth. Well, there are still bars and banks and houses of ill repute, and not only that, in the 19 teens, uh, there was kind of a significant war that took place, it's called World War I. It was to be the war to end all wars, but then that didn't. And, and, and so what I'm trying to illustrate from Miller to White to Russell to Rutherford, how many of you have heard the name Mary Baker Eddy? Now, what group did she start? Yes, the first Church of Christ Christian Scientist. And she had a plethora of writings as well. The interesting thing about these 
and not, even, and not to mention even the Pentecostal movement that technically began at the Azusa Street Church of, uh, Church of Assembly of God, the Azusa uh, uh, Assembly of God in Los Angeles, California, that which kind of ostensibly inaugurated the Pentecostal charismatic movement. What's interesting about all of these, from the early 1800s, even to the early 1900s, that all of these groups had prophets who had writings, and by the way, all of these groups started where geographically? The United States. Why do you suppose that that was? From a historical, sociological, political standpoint. Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion, which was not necessarily the case even in places like Europe, including Great Britain with a great still stronghold of when you, when you want to talk about the Anglican Church, which would be Episcopal in the United States, the Church of England, and how vast and how controlling was the Roman Catholic Church in Western civilization throughout Europe, and then the Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodox, as far as Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and Armenian Orthodox, and so it was very difficult for those movements to get legs much. Now we know the Protestant Reformation started in 1517 in Wittenberg, Germany. And who started that? Martin Luther. But while that brought about the Protestant Reformation, and we had Luther, and then we have a generation later John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, and then, of course, we've got John Smith, who begins the Baptist Church in 1611. It was called the First Baptist Church of England, but it was established on Dutch soil because he had been booted out of England. And so it started in Dutch soil, but that was in 1611. And then you've got the Congregationalists, you've got the Brethren, you again to the Reformed Church of the Calvins. Eventually that became the Presbyterians. I could go on and on, but... The, even the Protestant movement in Europe, what did that cause throughout Europe for a m number of decades, even centuries? What did that cause? Do, and more than just religious division, what else did it cause? How about bloodshed and war? And so the idea that because there wasn't a freedom of religion. Now what I'm trying to illustrate is you come to this country and after the American Revolution and with the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, this was the place for these movements to start. And what really started were these who claimed to be prophets, these who claimed to have prophetic writings, and that said, and if you read the preface, who came up with the New World Translation, by the way? Whose Bible is that, the New World Translation? Its first copy was in 1951. That's the Jehovah's Witness. You read in the originals, I have a, a, a copy of the 1951 in the preface, of that, there they point out that it was inspired with absolutely no mistakes whatsoever. Well, in 1961, they came up with a revision because of what they found to be mistakes 10 years later, and it's been revised several times since, since then. But there's this claim that their understanding and that their writing of their Bible is somehow, it was extra inspired and it was, it was more accurate than what we find in the translations, especially as they would talk about maybe the King James, the New King James, New American Standard, and so forth. What I'm really trying to illustrate in all of this is that when you look at these people that claim to be prophets, what we've seen over and over and over with all of the names and with Mary Baker Eddy even as well, with health and, and, and science and key to the scriptures, if you've ever looked at that work that she has written, and you can go to Christian Science Reading Rooms today, the Christian Science Monitor, which is a respected newspaper, by the way, but yet when you look at this, you're going to find some things in common, even as Mary, Mary Baker Eddy claimed that in reality there is no sickness or disease, there is no death, this is just a lack of faith and so forth, what I'm trying to illustrate is that we are seeing failed prophecies in books that have been written that are just failure, failure, failure. And yet of these particular types of religious organizations, how many people are involved when you look at the world's population of those groups right there that I'm talking about? Millions and millions and millions of people. Now, if our Old Testament prophets had that kind of history or record, like William Miller, Ellen G. White, Charles Russell, 
Judge Rutherford, Mary Baker, I mean all of them, Eddie. If we had prophecy after prophecy in our Bibles of these men, then what would that do with the authenticity, the authority, the legitimacy of what we call the Scripture? Exactly. Of no effect whatsoever. And yet, that's not what we find when we get involved into prophetic studies of the Bible. Because these were, as Peter said, holy men of God, yes, but they were directed by the Holy Spirit. And as we've discussed, and we're going to go into much more detail later on, but even kind of touched the hem of it a couple of weeks ago, so that when there was the discovery of 1947, what great discovery archaeologically and, and, and textually was discovered in 1947 in the caves of Qumran by the Dead Sea? A lot of hints there. The Dead Sea Scrolls. But when those were discovered in the excavations from 1947 clear up into 1956, did they, were they able to disprove these prophets, disprove what we know as the Bible, or did we find more information and more validity to the Scripture? That's the amazing thing. Particularly what's known as the scroll, or the scrolls, two of them with the scroll of Isaiah. In other words, I know Dennis... I think you said that you, you, you've you seen the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit. Have you seen it here in this country? How many have seen that? I don't know if Wade and Betsy have seen it. But that is worth seeing. That is worth seeing. It's fantastic. And I'm not sure when it's going to come back to the, to the States here. But um, um, it's really worth seeing. Now, I gave you an assignment two weeks ago. I said you had two weeks to do it because I went singing last week. How many remember that you even had an assignment? Hey! Oh, hey, several hands! I love it. Okay. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. I, that, was called, that was called the family advantage since we met today and so forth. But, uh, so, David, since, David, what did you find out? The assignment was find out something about Cyrus, right? What did you find out, David? Yeah, and, and it's going to be an approximate date, but pretty close. Well, I found out a lot about Cyrus. And <laughs> Cyrus, yeah. Answer your question, and I well, tell us what you find. It was. What did you find interesting about Cyrus that you would just like to share? One of the top ones I listed was the Babylonian captivity. Yeah. And you find out that Cyrus was very influential in Babylon. Yeah. And he was with Peter and Paul, and that looks pretty good on the resume. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. With who is that now? Oh, Silas. Yeah, no, the, the assignment was Cyrus. C Y R U S. Ah. No wonder I couldn't answer. Ah. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> That's you know what, Dave, David. Though, but he should get credit for doing all the work, right? Yes. All right. I mean, you're not passing the course, I but I mean. <laughs> ah. See, That's okay. That's funny. Uh, Sandy, what did you find about? Can I everybody turn to Isaiah chapter 44? Because we're looking at 44. Now, how many, let me see a show of hands, how many in your research did find, there's going to be several passages, but how many of you did find this Isaiah 44, 45 thing? Good, several of you did. So let's turn there. So what did, what did you, what, what, what stood out in your mind with that? Well, unfortunately, after that, I wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I've got a whole bunch of stuff from the Dead Sea Scrolls that I didn't get. I'm sure I didn't get what you wanted. Because I got information. Well, and, then, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the correlation of that is at least the Dead Sea Scrolls, which authenticate Isaiah's prophecy and his book, including exactly, exactly, which up to the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for centuries there was no complete scroll or book of Isaiah, and, and those scrolls, those scrolls legitimized what was said about Cyrus in chapters forty-four and forty-five. So to look at 44 and verse 28 there God says to the prophet it is I who says of Cyrus oh by the way I've got a Cyrus the Great 
And he was approximately about born about 576 uh, BC. Remember BC time, the, the, the years are going down. And uh, there's a little question as to the exact date of his, of his birth. Uh, there is more validation to his death in 530 BC, Cyrus the Great. But here is Isaiah, and at minimum, as I'm going to show you some dates a little bit, that Isaiah, in Isaiah 44, at minimum, writes this 110 years before the birth of Cyrus, at minimum, 110 years. And it may be more than that. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. Now when he says, my shepherd and my desire, who's really talking here? God is through the prophet. And he declares at Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. What had happened to Jerusalem and the temple? It had been destroyed. By the way, uh, what year had it been destroyed? In the the uh, uh, 586? 586. 586. Yeah. And because Assyria, uh, because Northern Kingdom was sacked in 722, and then Jerusalem and the, the temple was destroyed in five, between 570, 587 and 586. Most chronologists will give it, all right. And it had been destroyed. And then when we look, because don't forget the numbers are going down. He is born somewhere, probably about 10 years or so. He's born about 10 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Do we all see that? And then he's going to become the king of Persia. And here is Isaiah, at least 110 years previous to that. So we know when he was. We know when Isaiah was. And, and then when you go on into chapter 45 of Isaiah, just keep reading. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. Now, why would it say, why would the prophet, and why would God say to the prophet, call Cyrus this Persian Gentile king? Why would he refer to him as his anointed? Cyrus, his anointed. Because what is the anointed? What is that? I was going to say, he was going to do what God had determined in his mind that he was going to do. Yeah, because he was chosen by God to do this, wasn't he? The anointed in this case is the chosen. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus is anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. You know, this is a very, very interesting prophecy that Cyrus is called by name 110 years at minimum before he was even born. Um, now, did you find any other passages, though, that, yeah, wait, or any other, go ahead, or, no, go ahead, what else did you want to add there? trying to say that he was one of the first great kings that allowed the nations they conquered to go ahead and practice the religion that were already in place, and then he used the money from their own treasury to rebuild the temple. And a very smart thing to do as far as keeping the people happy and in line and so forth. And so we often refer to this, by the way, but what Cyrus did, we call, what do we often call that, what he did? That's a decree. Yes, the decree of Cyrus. Cyrus's decree of the decree of Cyrus. And that was a decree that because there had been the 70 year captivity. Now, who was it that caused uh, Jerusalem to fall and who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 586? Actually, what empire did that? Yeah. That was Babylonian. And with Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have these series of Babylonian kings. But Babylon would then be defeated by whom? Persian. And the Medo-Persians, together with, with Darius and Darius the Mede and Cyrus of Persia. And that would bring about the end of the Babylonians. And now we have the Medo-Persian Empire. And so when you look at this historically, and as Hoyt just brought out, that in the vast Persian Empire that was ever spreading... 
it was Cyrus that indeed did that, allowed the people to practice, in many cases, their own religion, as long as they did not try to revolt through that religion or system against the Persian authority. Um, what other passages does anybody come up with when it comes to, uh, to this? Uh, Tim? I would say in chapter 41, in verse 2, it doesn't say Cyrus' name, but many believe that that's what Abu Isaiah was referring to. Read it nice and loud, would you, Tim? Yeah. It says, Who stirred up one from the east, whose victory meets at every step. He gives up nations before him, so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. All right. Oh, sorry. All right. I was going to say, Brent, one other thing that um, there are some skeptics that will try to say that well, somebody else wrote that after, uh, you know, afterward, they, they put that in there, but, um, you know, that, just the wording that you read in, in uh, Isaiah 44, and uh, and actually goes into verse 1 of 45, um, you know, it's like, why would, why would you put that in afterward, you're using future tense, but just just to make yourself right, which um, you know, there's enough um, evidence. I even saw that there was someone that teaches at Abilene Christian right now that is one of those skeptics. Yeah, not to be surprised by some of the uh, uh, universities and the skeptics that they have with that. What are some other passages, Vicki, because I want to get to these because I can't believe the time the way it goes, but Go ahead, and uh, Vicki and then Clint. Well, I, I just know that it's been in Ezra 1. Right, and, and a lot in Ezra. Is, is that what you have, Clint? Because you have to understand that it's with Ezra, and you've got Ezra 1, you've got Ezra 4, uh, you've got Ezra 5, Ezra 6, all those chapters which will mention Cyrus by name. In fact, I want to show you a couple of things here. Let me first of all show you this. Uh, we're going to get to these passages in, a, in just a moment. But, uh, in fact, an artist's rendition, the one up to the top right, is uh, Cyrus actually and Daniel. That it's when, when Daniel was before Cyrus. And because uh, Daniel came into prominence just at the very, uh, near the end of the reign of Cyrus. Uh, but how many of you are familiar with the uh, Cyrus, the, the Cyrus Cylinder? Okay. In fact, did you deal with the cylinder in your lesson? I can't remember. You showed a picture of it. But one of the things, now understand, this was not produced by a Bible prophet. This, was not, this is not something that is even found in the scripture itself as far as, well, the cylinder of Cyrus. Now, Cindy, you raised your hand. You're familiar with it. What do you know about that cylinder? I think it resides in the British Museum in London. Okay. Cyrus's titles, and uh, it has a statement to the effect of, I will allow a freedom of religion, and I will allow those who were uh, captive to go back to their homelands. Exactly. Like exactly in correlation to what we find in the biblical text. So this is really what you would call a non-biblical, a more of a secular, if you will, from their own political and whatnot, and, and so, in the information on the cylinder of Cyrus, that it coincides perfectly with what we find in the scripture. And so that's really important. So it's also important that the non-secular confirming the word of God. Exactly. That non-secular things, as they come up and are produced, is just showing, again, they don't contradict, but they authenticate what we have within scripture. I just found this interesting of what they found on the left is the original and then what they, the artist did to show what it probably looked like before it was faded and worn probably by sand and so forth. But what they call the four-winged guardian figure representing Cyrus the Great. And often he was depicted with these wings and so forth. As far as the passages in Cyrus in the Old Testament, so we, we've looked at Isaiah 44. We see about the time of 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 this period of time that was going to be going on uh, in, Isaiah's, in Isaiah's life in prophecy, that he was born about 740 and died in 686. 
But in 2 Chronicles, we find that there was a prophecy, uh, or the historical uh, account of what had gone on. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah spoke to this as well. You don't find this in the book of Jeremiah, but Jeremiah had many, many other prophecies that were given. But it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, whoever there is among you of all his people. The Lord, uh, his God, be with him. So when you go to Ezra then, when you go to Ezra, Ezra will talk about, in Ezra 1, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And what he put in writing. And Ezra 1, 1 and 2 is basically a repetition of what you see in 2 Chronicles 36. Now, Cyrus's name is not mentioned in Jeremiah 25. And by the way, in Ezra 1, 4, 5, and 6, Cyrus's name is seen in all those because of his decree and sending tens of thousands of Judeans back to Jerusalem as a workforce to rebuild the foundation and the temple. Now in Jeremiah 25 and verse 12, then it will be, Jeremiah prophesied, when the 70 years are completed. So understand that from the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the fall of Jerusalem and Judah in 586 and go to 70 years later, as we go down in those numbers, but 70 years, that takes us to Cyrus. That takes us to that period of time. And Jeremiah says, when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and nations, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. Babylon was destroyed, and who became the next empire and king? Medo-Persia and Cyrus. And then you have all of the Ezra passages that I've referred to. And by the way, in Daniel, so Daniel, I showed that picture before, that Daniel 121, and Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. Daniel 6, 28. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And in Daniel 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the message was true in one great conflict, but, under, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision that was given at that time. I want us to see, because we're really out of time, but, but I want us to see over and over and over that the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah came to pass. The time factor of Isaiah and Jeremiah, and others, but of these two, are absolutely coincide when we look at this part of history that archaeologically has been discovered, and there are just a, a great amount of archaeological evidences of this time period. Now, what you have before you here in a Persian inscription, it's not Hebrew, certainly not Greek, but here as they have found this, on that, the inscription, that one stone thing you saw, and in translated, it has him saying, I am Cyrus the Great, the Achaemenid, and that is, was a term for Persia, and one from Persia, the first Persian empire. But I am Cyrus the Great, and again, the time factor that is brought about to this absolutely coincides, uh, uh, what's the word I was after? Coincides, thank you. Coincides to the biblical record. It, this is one example. That's why I asked, do some research. Does anybody have anything else on Cyrus they wanted to bring out that you found interesting? Tim, because we're out of time, but you're going to have those kids come in, but... 44 28, it says, Your foundation shall be laid. Yes. Is it true that it was just the foundation and that took the. Well, remember, they started the foundation, then they stopped the work and began to build their own houses. Yeah. And then he says, How is it that we have our own houses, but we have not yet built a house for God? And then they started back in the project, and then they finished and they completed. What year was the temple, the temple completed? Anybody remember? Just do your 70 years, 516. And, it's, and that's what came about. It fell in 586. Well, what's 70 minus from 70 from 586? And the temple was completed in 516. 
and the Babylonian Empire was over, the Medo-Persian Empire came in, and just what had Nebuchadnezzar dreamed in Daniel 2 of the great image of those four empires, beginning with Babylon and the Medo-Persian. How can you study and look at this stuff and then begin to question the historical authenticity of Scripture? That just amazes me. See, this isn't like what Miller did and White did and Russell did and Rutherford did and Eddie did and Joe Smith did. Do you see the difference? They were even just okay. <laughs> okay, that's right. Thank you very much. We're, 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 we're past time. It just goes by too fast. Tim's going to talk about messianic prophecies next week. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. But Tim says he's probably only going to deal with about 20 or 30 of them. <laughs> Thank you very much.